Okay, welcome to Growing Down Podcast. Today we are joined by David Hartful. Uh, welcome, David, to the show. It's, it's an honor to have you. Yes. We wanted to just start off with just a little, um, maybe if you could introduce yourself to our listeners a little bit, a little bit about your background and, and how you came to Integral Theory. Uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, my name is David Hartful, and I founded the Black Leadership Analysis Podcast, where I look at racial justice from an ego development standpoint. So what I do is I take different black leaders and I um, rate them on the scale of ego development. And the goal of the site is really so instead of taking a test and having someone tell you what your center of gravity is, you can read the site and see which leaders actually fit you best. Which of these people would you follow more? And that's going to give you your um, center of gravity as far as spiral dynamics goes. I'd always been worried, uh, interested in psychology and um, meditation and things like that. I was suffering from depression in my early 30s. I'm like, I'm 38 now. I'll be 39 this year. So in my early 30s, I was really um, depressed. So I started looking at different ways to uh, conquer depression. So that's why I started studying psychology. And I, thought, and I studied, uh, I started with Freud because that's the only guy I knew really. Um, and I did Freud and Young and um, Adler a little bit. And then I realized that these guys all can't be right. It'd be nice if someone put these into a hierarchy for me so I can understand them. <laughs> it turns out somebody had already done that. So I found out about uh, Spiral Dynamics from Leo Gara, his uh, podcast or his YouTube show. He had a video on it and I just loved it. It just explained so much. And, he, and his was on Claire Graves. So as soon as that uh, video was done, I got online and I bought the Claire Graves books from the Claire Graves website. I read through them and then I found a group of people here in DC that studied integral theory. And I got with them and started talking. And then after Trump was elected, I felt like we really needed to look back at all these different social justice strategies. Because we're not gonna be able to fight the fight we're going into without really understanding our past. So I started the site and at first I was just gonna do people um, that I thought were contemporary, like other YouTubers and things. And then um, Don Beck contacted me. He thought I was trying to steal his copyright at first. And I was like, yo, yo, I'm not trying to do that. Calm down. like. So me and him got to talking and we actually understood each other a lot better. And so with Don Beck, I had his, his book on spiral dynamics because that was the only one available on Amazon at the time. So I started off the first year, I wanted to summarize all the spiral dynamics books. I wanted to summarize all the spiral dynamics books in the short videos. That way, you know, if you're like a working person, you got stuff going on, you don't have time to read three and 400 page books. So I tried to summarize them into smaller pieces. And then um, me and him got to talk and he liked my videos and he sent me the crucible and I couldn't find the crucible anywhere. Like I looked my butt off and I summarized it. And so uh, that's how it all started. Then I just take, started taking black leaders one by one and going through them. I want to take a step back for just a moment and ask what your definition is of social justice or racial justice, especially informed from your integral and spiral dynamics background. I've seen a lot of confusion both in the integral community and the larger culture at large where it seems like there's a lot of confusion about the terms and um, there's a lot of people talking over each other because they don't have that mutual understanding. So how do you define these, these words like social justice? Well, uh, for me, social justice is dismantling the system that disadvantages people Due to their birth. So when you take that, uh, uh, that, that definition of social justice, you can expand it to outside of America, like the Indian caste system. You know, you can include that in the social justice fight. You can also include uh, the Maori people in New, um, in, um, New Zealand um, when you do that. So it's a system that disadvantages people from birth and it doesn't change the status no matter what the person does in life. So there's a fundamental difference between being a black person and a poor white person. Whereas the poor white person, if they go and they get rich, they can just be part of mainstream society. Whereas black people, even if you are rich, you still have that same stigma. So it's a different set of things to worry about and to, uh, and to, and to tackle. And that's why we, um, that's why I call, that's why, that's how I look at my site. And I chose the term black on purpose instead of African because I felt like black can include so many more people. Like black can include the Maoris, 
uh, people of color in Asia and, and a lot of different people. So I wanted to grow it to where more people than just black Americans can feel that they're a part of it too. Yeah, Dave, before we go too far ahead, I just want to, again, kind of go back to your intro there. And did you, did you say the crucible was one of yes. the books? Oh, the crucible was um, Don Beck's book on South Africa when he went to South Africa all those times. Oh, so that's okay. the one that specifically talked about race. Okay. Awesome. I wasn't aware of that one. Thank you. Yeah. So I did mine on Graves and Graves, Graves has two books on spiral dynamics. The one book was his uh, actual research. And that was actually the notes he took in the labs. And then there's a larger, thicker book that's about five or 600 pages that is his um, magnum opus that explains, that explains the theory. And so Beck has a spiral dynamics book, which is geared to business professionals. So you can um, actually improve your human resources and things like that. And then the crucible was the one I could never find. That's actually the one where he talks about being in South Africa. And in South Africa, he helped the clerk sell the removal of apartheid to Afrikaner South Africans. So when de Klerk did all his speeches trying to explain to the white South Africans why they had to um, end apartheid, it was Don Beck who helped de Klerk write those speeches. Yeah, wow, I was, I was never aware of that. Mm -hmm. It's a hard book to find. Um, but yeah, you, you, if you can get it, uh, definitely get it and read. It's a great read. I have the summaries on my website under Spiral Dynamics Theories. If any of the listeners want to uh, listen to that before, uh, in the meantime till they can get the book. Sure. Uh, this is sort of another foundational question, but uh, speaking of that book maybe or some of the initial works of Claire Graves and Don Beck that you were researching, uh, what were the... I don't want to say conversion moments, but in some ways, yeah, what were the kind of the aha moments with Spiral Dynamics work and Claire Graves work uh, that made you really interested in what they were doing? Like, what was the kind of metanoic moment, as it were? Well, for me, it just explained um, different uh, ways of thought in the Black community. And, you know, you have more of your separatist waves and your integrationist waves. And... Uh, the red meme for me was really people who are asserting themselves, like we are uh, the true black people, like we are the more authentic version of black people, like I'm more hood, so that makes me more authentic than this other person who's more of a sellout. I understand that. Instead of just being angry at that dynamic, I can actually understand that as red meme. And then, you know, you have all the different factions and different religions, whether it's Nation of Islam or the black church, and they're representing the blue meme. And then you have the black capitalists coming in saying that we're not going to really fix racism by marching and singing. So we should just concentrate on building business and building economics. Well, that's the orange meme. And then you have the more eclectic black people who want to bring all the different races together representing the green meme. So before I just saw all these different factions at war with each other, and I had to try to pick which one of those I wanted to be in. Well, with Spiral Dynamics, I saw this natural progression in thought. And then I understood that I didn't have to pick one thing or the other thing. I could grow through this in a spiral dynamics fashion. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you're practically applying this knowledge. I mean, you've described really well there are all these competing factions and different mimetic clashes going on in this very specific niche of, you know, the black community and some of the social justice movements that are around right now. So, like, how do you what, – what is your goal with, with um, this the, – the leader? Like, is it to – try to harmonize the different factions or get them to understand each other? Like, what are you, what are you trying to do with this? I want to make an integral version of social justice. I want something that could really bring all different types of people together into one goal. And the great thing about looking at it from a spiral dynamics perspective, at the stage you are right now, you can be a part of this. So you don't have to become a completely integral person, fully self-actualized before you can start doing anything. You can work within the red meme right now in this movement and do red meme work. And if you're in blue meme, you could come in at the blue meme level and do blue meme work. So it'd be a whole different way to look at social justice. And I think, I hope to influence other thought leaders um, in the black community and uh, make it more open to different types of people. So David, do you, you actually work at the Capitol, is that correct? Are you? It, yes, but I'm a building maintenance person. Like I do right. projects for building maintenance, yeah. So that might be, that's that must be pretty interesting to have the knowledge you do of integral and then just to kind of see 
how Washington kind of works. What, what's, what's your insight being on the ground level there? Well, I mean, I don't, like I said, once you understand the interval, you don't get upset and emotionally turned by stuff. So you see, you know, the Republicans in there pushing for what they're pushing for. You see, okay, they're just orange meme, unhealthy orange meme individuals. You see AOC and she's coming in from the green perspective and you understand why the people have the arguments against each other that they have. So it gives you like a, a, a 9,000 foot perspective to where you can interact and talk with anybody and you stop seeing anybody as an enemy. That's like the most powerful part is not seeing anybody as the enemy. You know, um, so I, I, it does give you, it does give you a lot of, um, of interesting insight there in the Capitol building. And what has, what has your response been uh, amongst other African Americans? Oh, I mean, most people uh, really like um, the theory when they uh, start looking into it. It makes a lot of sense to them. Um, I'm just now getting, um, growing my following. So I'm just now getting more and more people interested too. But a lot of people have uh, grown from it and, um, and felt like it was really, you know, a necessary thing. And also on, I have a Facebook group too, also called Black Leadership Analysis. But there I try to do more alternative media so people get more than one uh, news source. So they get a, a larger picture of what's going on. Because I think that's very important in Interval too to have uh, multiple different news sources competing to understand all the different mimetic uh, pieces. So I think that's another big piece of it too. And I guess here, I'll, I'll put the million dollar question out here uh, at the early spot. Uh, where do you identify yourself on that spiral dynamic sort of uh, spiral? I'm in green. I consider myself in green. Okay. Um, I want to bring uh, different people together and I, I'm, I actually I feel very uncomfortable talking about the hierarchy because I want pe I really do people feel, feel that people should be respected as an equal in whatever meme they're at because in reality as you're actually going through work doing social justice work you'll need somebody in every meme to get what you need done done. Like there will need to be a time if someone's confronting you in a violent manner that you need a red mean person with you who's going to stand up to them. And it's good to have those blue mean people that have um, the ideology down and make sure we don't get off message. So I think it's really important to have all these different meme stack people with us this whole time. So, um, you know, I, I consider myself in green, but I, I want to bring in uh, enough people to where we can have a fully yellow meme uh, movement at the very end of it. You asked the million dollar question, Matt, but there's a $2 million question or, or topic, which is what's going on right now in Minneapolis and all over the country. Um, and, and I think that the implicit question I was thinking of in terms of uh, interviewing you was, was how to understand what is going on in our nation presently through a spiral dynamics and integral analysis. Uh, that including, you know, the, the eruption of, of protests and the event um, that is going on right now, but then also the, the kind of the subtext of that, like what is an integral analysis of uh, 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 the, this crisis in America right now? Because I think well, we need it. Yeah, I think that what's going on right now with the riots, one thing with the riots, I'm just getting news reports now that a lot of the riots were started by agent provocateurs, whether they're from white supremacist camps or from the government, I don't know which one, and it's hard to say right now. But, um, you know, you have these agent provocateurs really stoking these fires, but to move past more of the conspiracy theory type stuff, I wanna really talk about um, w what rioting is just in and of itself. So King talked about in, um, in 65, there were all these riots, like Watts riots and whatnot. And even after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, there were still riots. And they were asking King, you know, why are there still riots after the Voting Rights Act and after we desegregate buses? And King was like, the riots are happening because of um, just all this unhealed trauma in the community that's trying to express itself. And so this, so in that time period in the civil rights movement, America was trying to move from blue to orange. And anybody who's done personal development work knows when you're transitioning to a different meme, that's probably the most chaotic point in your life. So a lot of things just have to work themselves out from a, a mimetic perspective. 
So when you're going through this, you have those red meme people that are doing uh, the rioting or the red meme aspect of those people is manifesting through the rioting and things like that and the angry slogans. But this is something that has to exercise itself for us to get to the new, to the new spot. And I think we're trying to move from orange to green now in this country. So we have to expect all this shadow work that's been plugged up in America for so long to exercise itself and come out. And I mean, again, I don't know how much of the violence was actually started by protesters and how much of it was started by provocateurs. And we won't know this for about 10 or 15 years until we get all the paperwork coming out. So um, it's, just, um, it's just really interesting there to, uh, uh, to talk about to talk about that kind of thing um, and um, and understand this is the shadow work of people expressing themselves and exercising these demons in what what we're seeing as riots and I think the big problem in the integral community and in the self development community in general is that it's very orange me like it's more about individual work and individual shadow work instead of understanding what collective work is going to look like and having an ear and understanding of that. So yeah, I think it's something we need to really be very cognizant of um, there, um, right there in the, um, in, in this space too. And I think we need to understand these larger uh, movements from the more personal perspective too. And I think if we can, we can uh, mesh those things together, we can actually be really great guides in this movement, so. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and ask the $64 million question. <laughs> so, I mean, when you're talking about this expression, this kind of explosion of collective trauma and wounding that has been inflicted from intergenerational oppressive policies and, you know, behaviors and police brutality, and we can go down the whole list, right? Yeah. What are some of your main, um, I guess, solutions that you would think about that would help the most amount of people at once or in terms of maybe policies or cultural movements. I mean, you know, we, there's so many, there's so much out there, right? We have black lives matter. We have uh, the whole conversation about around race reparations and obviously like affirmative action, that kind of thing. What's kind of your angle to how we can fix this whole mess that we're in? I mean, I think you gotta look at it from a four quadrant perspective. I mean, for me, meditation was really huge in my development and working through a lot of trauma. So we look at meditation, there's a little bit of upper left and a little bit of upper right to it because it is an actual action you do as meditation, but that action involves inner work too. So meditation along with shadow work is very important and that's something that's going on on the individual level. But outside the individual level, you can't just throw off the, uh, the ability of society to cause problems in, in this space. So, I mean, I think social programs are very important as far as I'm a big proponent of Medicare for all because that's a huge uh, financial burden on a lot of families. I support uh, funding to uh, inner city schools and things like that. So I think uh, more of like Bernie Sanders plan uh, for the political environment is what I really support. And the thing is Sanders plan is really coming from uh, A. Philip Randolph's freedom budget that he proposed in 1968. Like most of the stuff in Sanders' plan is from A. Philip Randolph's freedom budget. And most people don't even know that. Um, so A, you know what A. Philip Randolph is, right? Like um, A. Philip Randolph is the man that started the Pullman car porters. So back in the 40s, there were no black unions and black people weren't legally even allowed to form unions. Well, A. Philip Randolph made the first black union with sleeping car porters on trains. He became part of the, um, uh, the uh, United Trade Unions, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but the major uh, corporation for trade unions. And after that, he became deep in, involved in politics, and he actually proposed a budget to, I want to say it was Eisenhower originally, it might have been uh, Kennedy, but he had proposed a budget to start all these social programs, a lot of which we're using today, as far as, you know, um, uh, food assistance and things like that. And A. Philip Randolph is the person that in introduced Dr. King to Eisenhower and then later Kennedy. Yeah, A. Philip Randolph's the man who actually did that. Um, so in Birmingham, no, in Montgomery, I should say, the leader of the Seepin' Call Porters was a man named Ed Nixon. 
And Ed Nixon was so impressed with King's uh, leadership ability that Ed Nixon told A. Philip Randolph about King, and that's what got the ball rolling to get King in front of Eisenhower. And so the sleeping car porters did a lot of the funding for the early civil rights movement. So it's all building off of each other like that. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. I've never heard of A. Phil Randolph. Thanks, Dave, for uh, I'll have to look him up and, and know more of his history. One of the things that um, I was sort of reading this morning, um, and it's a theme that we've returned to often on Growing Down. Um, this was an editorial by uh, K. Cole Jones, and it was on uh, Fox on the Fox mm -hmm. News site. Talked about how racism um, afflicts America's soul like a cancer. Yeah, I mean. Um... Uh, that's the thing with race. Like, uh, one, one thing I hate is a lot of people say that they just don't see race because they see race as just something that's divisive. Race can be something that unites you with people also. And it's, it's an also based to help to understand where someone's coming from and from their perspective. So I think we have to understand and have healthy relationship with race within ourselves before we start interacting. And so racism is really really deep deep down with racism is people don't fully understand their own ethnicity and then when they interact with people from different ethnicities ethnicities they have an even difficult more difficult time i don't see one of the things king talked about in uh, the book on the montgomery bus, bus boycott was he was upset that none of the white preachers talked to any of their congregants about how life is going to be different with an integrated bus so King actually had a class on how to act on an integrated bus and how to not uh, cause more problems, how to be courteous. And that's something that King had in Montgomery, but he looked at none of his white counterparts as doing that. And I think that if white people have a way to understand their ethnicity better, a lot of these problems will, uh, will solve themselves too. So I think there's a lot of shadow work people need to do about around being white also, so they can be able to interact with people uh, a lot better. So my, my big question is, how can we go about doing this? I mean, presumably from an integrally informed perspective in a way that's not going to turn people off or get them upset or feel like they're kind of like under attack. And, and I guess um, I guess my question would be like, how, how would we frame everything you just said, you know, being more aware of your the lived experience that you have due to some of your circumstances on ethnicity or, you know, you're being white or whatever. How can we go about this in a way that can be more effective maybe than some of the other methods that are more divisive that are existing right now? Well, there is a thing called white identity development. So uh, back in the 70s, uh, there was this movement on ethnic identi identity development start started by Dr. William Cross. And so William Cross uh, put forth this um, theory called Negrizance. And Negrizance was a progression in how someone identifies as Black. So uh, what Dr. Cross was talking about was in the beginning, you start off at pre-encounter. And at that stage, you don't have an understanding of race and where you fit in in terms of race. And because you have, don't have a solidified self, you're more susceptible to the negative stereotypes put forth on you by society. So either once you have no um, way to guard against that, you'll internalize a lot of negative ideas about yourself. Then they'll happen in your life, something that'll force you to confront race, which we call the encounter. And so uh, whether you're uh, denied employment somewhere or someone ostracizes you because you're black, you'll end up going into something called encounter. And then once you have the encounter, you'll move into what we call emerging, E-M, and then emerging, emerging, I-M uh, uh, stage. And so first you immerse yourself in black culture. You'll be in black identity groups. You'll want to separate yourself from white people. And then as you progress down that lane, you'll want to emerge out of this as a new person. And so there'll be a time when you'll have uh, a lot of, uh, express a lot of anger or resentment at white people. You'll want to separate yourself. And then you can emerge out of that and you can go into one to three paths. Either a person becomes monocultural, they see themselves as only African and nothing else. They become bicultural. They see themselves as African and American. And then the other one is multicultural, where they have various different um, saliencies that they can all put together and they're all harmonized and they're not, um, and they don't conflict with one another. And so 
understanding this progression in black self identity helps you to move through uh, your psychology and understand why you're having the conflicts you're having. And there's very predictable conflicts between people in various stages, just like there's very predictable conflicts with people in various stages of ego development. And I think once we, I think the first step of all this is to put out these ideas about spiral dynamics and ethnic identity development. I think these are very important things to put out there because it gives you that nine thousand foot perspective and understand as we're doing this shadow work it's going to be upsetting like there's no way when you're doing shadow work to not be upset and angry and sad because that's just part of shadow work so we have to understand how to not to re-traumatize ourselves, but actually look at it and work through it and move through it. And I think at the end, it won't be a raceless society. It'll be a society where people understand and um, understand race and are comfortable with their race. That's the goal instead of a raceless society. And just to kind of riff on that question too, um, are there sort of concrete practices or um, workshops or examples or, or, or ways in which you're applying this this process of, of moving through these different phases like is there is there a community application practice oh yeah I mean there could be I'm not doing them yet because I'm still trying to build my following but I mean I think that it would be very easy to have a workshop on negrizance I think that'd be very easy to do um, I don't know much about white identity development yet I haven't got those books yet I'm sure you could have um, a class on that. A person that's actually doing that is a woman named Ruth King. She is a Buddhist teacher and her book is called um, uh, Mindful of Race. And she uses mindfulness and race together. And she also talks about having white identity groups where white people can work on their own identity. And you could understand how to uh, understand your ethnicity and be proud of it and accept it while accepting other people's ethnicity. And I think that's a big piece that is lost in today's race conversation. People think that you have to become raceless and not see race. And I think that's a big, and then you have a certain set of people, both black and white, who wanna have pride in who they are and are not ashamed of who they are. We just have to get those people to see themselves in a healthy manner and not see themselves as antagonistic to other people's ethnicity or superior to other people people's ethnicity yeah that sounds very interesting and and in some ways um you know a lot of the conversation or at least the cultural conversation is very often um framed around pausing any kind of discussion around white identity aside from deconstruction aside from you know being historically aware of, of of white essentialism basically that arose in the 20th century to kind of oppose um, uh, African American rights, etc. Um, I only really hear that, right? But to have something that's, oh, you know what? There's different ethnicities and identities and etc. within white communities that have been lost in the process of essentializing whiteness, right? That really needs to be reclaimed because the idea is like, okay, well, what what do white people have to go back to, right? There's a sense of loss of their own traditions, cultures, ethnicities, et cetera. Um, so, so to really kind of positively frame that seems much more constructive and helpful for this um, yeah. than not, yeah. So just like Dr. Cross said, there will be some black people that will be monocultural. They will see themselves as Africans. They won't necessarily want to deal with people from other races and they'll want to only concentrate on their Pacific culture and Pan-Africanism. And they can do that in a healthy manner. It doesn't have to be combative with everybody else. But there'll also be people that want to be bicultural and multicultural, and that's also healthy too. And I think if we uh, propose these healthy alternatives to white supremacy, I think that could really be a huge change in our racial discussion. But I can't do that, of course. I would need white people to do that. And I, I think that if white people understand negrizance and ethnic identity development and how it grows, I think that will facilitate them having those kind of workshops. So uh, Dave, you mentioned a little bit like shadow work uh, amongst this sort of subject. Is there anything we can do on this podcast to kind of illustrate what some of that work might look like? 
Well, I mean, I did, a, I did, I talked about it a little bit on my website. Um, well, I, uh, well, I started the, um, African, um, the African spiritual tradition of ancestor veneration. So I actually, during meditations, I actually imagine what my ancestors looked like and I try to reconnect with them, uh, during my meditations, which is an African spiritual practice. Now, I don't know what the equivalent of that is in Europe. Um, I don't know, but for me in meditations, doing ancestor veneration, actually trying to converse with my ancestors on a spiritual realm is something that really helped me to grow and move through a lot of the anger and uh, anguish I saw. So, or I, I felt myself. Uh, therapy also is very important. Again, that's why I support things like Medicare for all and whatnot, because if you can include psychological therapy in that, that could be a huge thing for poorer people to actually be able to go through therapy and work through some of their hidden issues. So you don't have to have it manifest itself in any social behavior. You know, this is a question I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on, David. I have I do some uh, mediation work and I had a mediation where I was trying to have a woman who was deeply ensconced in the social justice scene in Portland uh, have a dialogue with this guy who is kind of a stereotypical orange engineer dude. Yeah. Um, older white guy and he just could not see or understand the idea of the lower left quadrant and the influence of a culture or environment in shaping someone's consciousness so the whole idea of the lived experience of being a part of a certain race or ethnicity with the lived experience uh in terms of the upper left quadrant as it's been conditioned by the other quadrants he didn't understand that so all talk of race to him was basically upper right quadrant biology which he said is just racist bullshit right so i was trying I, and I, I failed in in trying to help him to understand that but i i see that as being one of the biggest confusions uh that people have about this whole topic is they they don't really understand i think when you're part of a dominant culture too it makes it very difficult to understand how the social fabric that you're swimming in is molding your lived experience do you have any thoughts on like how you i don't know do you want to just riff on that yeah, I mean, I talked to, when I started talking about ethnic identity development, I posted it in inner rural spaces. I started asking white people how they um, developed in their ethnicity. And half of them never thought of themselves as being ethnic. They never saw themselves as an ethnic person. And I'm like, yeah, white is an ethnicity. And that was like the first time it even dawned on them. So, I mean, I think that's a big problem when you start dealing with ethnicity and understanding them is that just even realizing white people realizing that they have an ethnicity and their ethnicity actually shapes how they're viewing the world and what they do. So um, I think that's a, a big piece. That guy you're talking about probably never understood himself as being ethnic because he's never, he might never have been in a foreign country. If he was in a foreign country, he understand he was ethnic because he would see himself in uh, another place where people are doing certain things and he would have to understand that and he'd understand why we do things the, the way we do it. You know, I remember this one lady, um, she, uh, she was talking to me about the call to prayer. There's a place where you can hear a call to prayer here in DC. She's like, I hate that. I was like, you, hear, you like church bells? It's the same thing. Like they don't make that connection of like, that's their church bells. I think a lot of it's going to have to do with the really understanding and, um, and uh, coming to grips with your own ethnicity. And again, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a good thing, something you love and you cherish yourself. So, one, I guess one of the questions that I have is looking at it from like race warfare versus class warfare. Yeah. And how much do you think, um, I guess, you know, with the riots going on right now, how, how much is class warfare sort of involved with that in your opinion? Oh, I mean, class and race aren't separable. Like that's very deeply intertwined, class and race. So you can't ever separate the two. And I think that's why you have some of the, uh, I mean, I don't know the demographics of the white protesters that are protesting alongside the black people, but I mean, I would like to, see, I don't know what their financial situation is, but there is some, some identity in that we're both poor people. And if we don't work together, none of us is gonna get ahead. So there is some solidarity around class, but you can't be a class reductionist. So even Bob Johnson, he's the guy who owns BET. He's a multi-billionaire. He even gets harassed at hotels because people don't think he should be there. Even though he's famous and people knows what he looks like, he still gets harassed and he's a billionaire. 
So, I mean, like you can't separate and say, well, if we get the class thing switched or figured out, we're good. And also you can't say if we get the race thing figured out, we're good because you're going to need to work both in tandem, you know? And I think that's something that they, people have to understand, um, understand with that. So, but um, with the Minnesota protest, man, <coughs> yeah, it's going to be tough to figure out what all happened because of the provocateurs and things like that. So, so what would be, um, hmm, uh, in terms of in terms of what's going on right now, uh, what would you like to see happening through this in terms of an integral direction I in mean, this process? I yeah, I mean, I would love to have a truly integral Black liberation movement where we understand the people coming from different perspectives and it's not just an infight between different factions of the movement. Everybody can fit in together. And a large part of that being shadow work and meditation, but understanding your social justice work as part of your shadow work. So understanding that by going out and protesting and staying peaceful and being aware of what's arising in you. So you don't do anything that is as bad or illegal or antisocial. Understanding it from that perspective. I think King was the, um, the closest one to that because King saw nonviolent direct action as a spiritual path. And by keeping yourself calm in those situations, you're actually growing spiritually. And the spiritual growth to him was paramount over the actual um, winning of the rights. He understood that the spiritual growth would naturally um, lead to the rights. And I don't think since him, there's been anybody even close to that. And that's why I've uh, studied King so much. I did the, the, from what I saw, the only integral analysis of Dr. King that's been done. And that's on my website in written form. I also have a couple videos on it. Um, so yeah, I think I, I really want there to be an integral movement of uh, black liberation. That's not just going, that doesn't just evolve into infighting. Cause I was watching a documentary on the Panthers and they talked about towards the end, Huey Newton was fighting Eldridge Cleaver for power over the Panthers. It seems like all these black liberation movements devolve into just factional fighting. And I think if you had everyone with the integral group perspective, you can actually avoid all that. Are you familiar with Cornell West's um, yeah. three levels of black leadership? Um, no. What, what are they again? I, I, I'm sure I've heard this before because I listen to a lot of Cornell West, but I, I, don't, um, I, I don't remember this exact talk. Yeah, yeah. It, it was in his book, uh, Race Matters. So uh -huh. if I recall correctly, the three leaders were um, – the first one was kind of like you talked about the orange, kind of the race effacing business guy, kind of the Larry yes. Elder archetype. That's kind of yeah. like the orange black leader. The second one he calls the race embracing rebel, which is more like the green, you know, activist kind of a archetype. And the third one, which I thought correlated with integral was called the race transcending prophet. And he kind of talks about some of the, the black leaders in the, the more um, artistic spheres uh, um, who are basically giving a voice to liberation movement in a, in a very spiritual way that kind of transcends the, it includes the, the racial differences, but also frames it in a larger humanistic spiritual picture that, that affirms a kind of a common ground as well. Okay, um, so I remember I, that. I remember uh, that now. I agree yeah. with that. But the thing of it is, is that I do like the idea of the race ascending prophet. However, we still need those guys to make concrete changes in society. And I mean, I respect musicians and prophets and uh, poets, but we need those people. We need those, uh, at least a set of people that's working to get actual things here on the ground for us. And I believe those things that we need are social programs uh, to help people when they're down, uh, free college and things like that. So you can actually uh, improve your light in life, job guarantee. You know, how important is a job guarantee to a person that knows they're gonna face job discrimination? in the workplace. I mean, at least with a job guarantee, you know that at worst, I'm gonna have a $15 an hour paying job working for the city. So, I mean, like, I think all these things kind of go together. Now, I not wanna, I, I wanna make clear that I think there is a conservative way to make an integral uh, black liberation movement. I'm just not that guy because I'm not a conservative. So, you know, I, I hate when people just push that, put down conservatism. I really want people to understand 
um, that you're going to need conservatives, liberals, and radicals in this movement. And we, we got to uh, work together to fight because Trump, people don't understand that Trump is really just a small piece of a much larger right wing puzzle that puts in Modi in India, that puts in Bolsonaro in Brazil, Boris Johnson in England. And so, you know, there's a large international right wing group coming together and trying to take power also. Can you, can you give an example of, because I saw you talking to Laban Pascal about this. I watched that video for 20 minutes before hopping onto this, this interview with you, but I really liked how you're talking about some kind of a version of the integral right and how that could kind of develop in a harmonious two-step relationship with the integral left that, you know, Jeremy and I and, and Matt are doing here. But um, what do you think the integral, an integrally informed right can really contribute to the overall picture in terms of conservative values articulated in a healthy and, and you know, nuanced way? Well, I mean, from a, uh, from a libertarian perspective, I think there are libertarian ideas that would help black people, like the legalization of decriminalization of all drugs. And if it's retroactive to where you release people from jail, that would be huge. I think that would be an important thing to work on. Um, also, uh, if you could find ways to remove red tape, to allow people to come together when that is the actual problem is the red tape. I think conservatives jump up and say government red tape is the problem too often when it's really there's a lack of funding. But um, if there is red tape keeping people from coming together and working together, we need to work on that. Um, of course, the, the concentration on uh, self, self-improvement, that's a very important thing. So. I think uh, interrural conservatism, conservatism in the black liberation struggle is very important. And I wanna, um, I wanna grow, see that grow and everything. But again, I'm not, I'm not a conservative, so I don't know all the specifics yet. Um, I actually worked really hard trying to get some black conservatives in the group, but um, it, was, it was tougher than I thought. David, who do you think on the ground right now in black culture is leading the way as far as being some of those prophets or uh, you know, right now, I know Killer Mike's coming up for me as far as being an activist in the community. Who else do you identify right now as being a voice that you can trust or that is in the social justice movement? Nina Turner, off the top. Um, she was a Bernie surrogate. But even now, um, she's really forging her own way and talking uh, a lot of truth to power. Of course, Cornell West is somebody I've admired for years. Um, RMA Osei Frempong, he does the show Funky Academic. He has some great commentary as a Kantian philosopher. And um, I, I like a lot of his work. I think RME is actually integral. Like he's one of the few people I'll say is actually integral. And, you know, Who is that like again? RMA Osei Frempong um, the, from the Funky Academic. I will send you a uh, Twitter link to one of his shows. But his show is great because he does local politics and philosophy. So he lives in Athens, Georgia. So he's giving you a framework that you can take back to your own city and start talking about local politics in your own city where you can actually have some uh, effect in getting things done. And I think that's what people need to really concentrate on going forward is um, concentrating on local politics to, um, to like uh, grow, grow the movement. You know, since you had mentioned Nina Turner, it reminded me of Bernie's campaign and his kind of failure to win over a large black constituencies as a, you know as a demographic that he didn't do very well with. What what are your if you're like his advisor, like what kind of advice would you give to him or to other progressives to further engage the black vote? He should have went to more black spaces. Like I wish he had done a rally at like South Carolina State right before the South Carolina primary. You know, that would have been huge if he had done that. Um, I felt like he was a little too afraid to speak to black people directly. I think he should have talked about his civil rights work more, even though there was one time he did it early in the campaign and there was one lady that booed him in the audience and then he backed down. It was, um, it was really early in the campaign and the lady in the audience was thinking he was trying to win sympathy by talking about King but he should have been uh, harder on his guns with that and said, look, I actually was there. I actually did get arrested. I was affiliated with CORE. And I wish he had talked about that a lot more. Um, and then talked about how his programs would specifically help black people because we have the lowest insured rate of any other group of people. 
to give us Medicare for all would be huge. I mean, I mean, because your health is obviously your most important thing. There is nothing more important than your health. And if you have that taken care of and it's not a huge burden in your life, you then free up money to do other things. So I think he just didn't talk enough about his, um, his uh, how his plans would help black America. You mentioned a couple of other, uh, uh, on, on your website, under Yellow Meme, there was a couple of different leaders that you're mentioning there. Did you want to mention any of them for us as just sort of recommending uh, leaders in the Yellow Meme? Oh, um, uh, Dr. Bimramo and Becker from India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the greatest Dalit activist, and Dalits are the Indian untouchables. And so um, the Indian um, untouchables, uh, back when Ann Becker was doing his work, were um, the most uh, castigated people in Indian society. And what Ann Becker was able to do was he lobbied the British government to give a, a political reservation to Dalits, to where they had uh, reserved seats in parliament, and then those seats will be determined by an all Dalit electorate. But as the years went on, um, Gandhi actually was against this idea because he wanted to be casteless, like just not just ignore the effects of caste over the years and try to just integrate everybody and act like nothing happened. Whereas M. Becker understood there need to be specific things done to redress the wrongs. And that conflict between the two is very timely now because we have those people that just want to be raceless and those that actually want to do things to specifically help the group of people that's been disadvantaged. And so that conflict between him and Ambecker was very important. But at the end of Ambecker's life, he actually converted to Buddhism and he converted over a hundred thousand uh, uh, Dalits to Buddhism. And he, in the a later part of his life, he understood that nothing's going to change until we do this inner work that we need to do. To improve, uh, to improve our condition. We have to actually build what he called a fellow feeling between each other. And that fellow feeling is something that's important, but it doesn't exclude the right half work of actually getting resources to people for them to improve their life. And um, I think that's a big part, a part, a part of things that the integral community, because we have a four quadrant perspective, can understand that yes, the inner work is very important and the inner work is what ultimately is going to end all these problems. But while we're doing this inner work, we still have to figure out ways to get resources into the communities that have been disadvantaged this whole time. I was just gonna ask, one of the guests that we had on our podcast was Pastor Delman Coates. Are you, are you familiar with him? No, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard of him. I, I need to get that. I was gonna read that podcast or listen to it, but is it up yet? Yeah, it's it's up. Basically, he's a, um, a black pastor in I think Baltimore, Maryland, and you know graduate of uh, Morehouse College, and he's trying to marry the the, the his congregation with uh, modern monetary theory as as to kind of unite a for a unitive uh, progressive platform. And I'm wondering, what do you think is the role of kind of the black churches in all of this, and especially the historical significance? Right, he calls it the fight for freedom, justice, and equality. And do you think that that specifically through these religious institutions, is that a good avenue to get to in your work? It's, it's integral. It's, 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 you can't do it without the black churches. Um, I would love to see more black churches um, integrate mindfulness into their work and meditation. Um, I would like to see more black churches working with uh, interfaith dialogue to um, allow for black people of all different faiths to come together. But this can't be done without the black church. And the black church is what most black people go to instead of therapy <laughs> because we usually can't afford it. So to be able to understand um, these issues and problems people are facing from an integral four quadrant perspective would be so helpful to have these ideas introduced to you in, from an institution that you already trust and that has already historically been for you. And I think that without the black church, none of this stuff is going, to, uh, is going to go anywhere because that's the institution a lot of black people trust to get information from. So we have to uh, figure out ways to get the black church into these, um, into these conversations. Now, myself, I'm a Buddhist. So I can't really be the guy to do that. That's why we have to bring in different people uh, into this movement so we can uh, make those things happen.
Yeah, I mean, I'm actually in, uh, I'm reading a book right now called Eco Dharma by I think it's David Loy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he talks about sort of this tap dance, and he he comes at it from a Buddhist perspective of how much is sort of enlightenment, sort of where you sort of withdraw from this world, or how much is it where you actually stay engaged in the world? And so right now he talks a lot about it in the in the Buddhist community about how do we tie in, for example, the ecological crisis with also this perspective on enlightenment. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, Thich Nhat Hanh has a story about um, the Heart Sutra. And the biggest problem with the Heart Sutra back in the day was there was this line in it that says that I have no nose. And it actually, it, that's how it was translated. What it actually says, if you get the original Chinese, it says that I am more than my nose. So um, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about this new monk that was talking to an old monk, and he asked him about the Heart Sutra, and the new monk said, I don't have a nose. And so the old monk punched him in the nose, and he's like, so what's bleeding now? And I think that's, and that's really what you need to know. So because you're doing this inner work, and because you can go into your room and you can self-actualize, you can meditate, and you can calm yourself down. That doesn't mean that you don't go out in the world and try to get yourself the resources you need to improve your life. Just because you can be equanimous with police brutality doesn't mean you allow it to go on. Just because you can be equanimous with having poor schools doesn't mean you allow this to go on. And being able to balance all this different stuff to not get caught into either of I'm just going to sit on a mountain and meditate or not caught into I'll do everything I can to get this one initiative passed. That is what being Buddhist is. Understanding that balance and being part of a community while being an individual. You know, those are the things that that is why you're doing your spiritual work. So there isn't a way to say do this and it's going to happen. That That is the actual work of I'm going to do my meditation. I'm going to, I'm going to separate but when i get off this cap cushion i'm going to make sure my brothers are okay and i think that's what you got it that's what you got to keep and i and so many buddhist circles they tell me that well uh and becker wasn't a real buddhist because he was a politician no and becker was a buddhist but he understood that he had to get these resources to his people and he couldn't just sit on a cushion indefinitely and so and becker focused on the right half more than the left half but the times he lived in forced him to do that. I think that now we have enough, um, enough neck room, enough breathing room that we can do both at the same time, but we can't lose sight of either one of those. And that's why I, I encourage people to focus on what's happening locally in their city instead of more nationally, because you can actually have an effect on what's happening in your city. And you can use what you're doing in your city as your shadow work. If you push for an injunction that doesn't go through, be equanimous with that, but understand how important that injunction was. And so I think that's where the movement needs to go. Yeah, that, that um, insight is, is, seems to be very um, reflective of what a lot of different communities and leadership in the left, democratic socialists and um, uh, post-Bernie campaign activists are, are trying to figure out what to do. And the theme is go local actually like focus on the down ballot focus on your local community focus on transforming the culture and the uh the the the, the openness to translating a lot of these ideas in local contexts so it, it seems to be the theme these days of kind of we, we talk about of course growing down as the theme of our podcast but it really also means kind of coming back down to the local the regional the um the ways in which we can get involved in a much more personal way and I think that's just so important. But um, I wanted to ask you about the um, one of the uh, people you mentioned under the yellow meme is uh, Zenju Earthlin Manuel. And yes. I just noticed you spent some quite a, quite a bit of time, uh, uh, or text at least, describing some of her background and achievements. So I wonder maybe you'd want to share that a little bit because um, with your background in Buddhism, um, uh, and I have a kind of a practice in Buddhism as well, so I'm just curious. Um, about why is she yellow meme, et cetera. So with, uh, with uh, Ms. Zinju, I, I love her because her book was about the importance of black spaces in Buddhism. 
Now, uh, Genji Earth, Earthland Manuel actually went to the Colorado Institute to get our certificate in interval theory. So she is a full on certified intervalist. She's also a Buddhist teacher. And she is even saying that the importance of black spaces are very important because it's in that black space for those black people that are going through the emerge emergence phase, uh, phase of Nigrazox, they need those spaces to feel comfortable. And so uh, if we're gonna help these people develop, we need certain spaces where they can come be introduced to Buddhism or integral theory where they're around people they know that are friendly. So they can talk about things going on in their life without having to worry about how are people gonna stereotype them. You need a space to say that my brother's about to go to jail and not have somebody look at you like, oh, well, they're all selling drugs. Like you need a space for that to say, I can come and talk about that and nobody's gonna look at me a certain way. Now, once you have those spaces, people are gonna get up and move to different spaces just like uh, Zinju did. After she had been in a, a black Buddhist community for long enough, she went back to the Shinto Buddhist community and got her certifications. And because she had that fortification in black Buddhism, and built her ego up around Buddhism and her confidence up around Buddhism, she was able to go to those Shinto spaces and, st and stay true to who she was and then come out of those spaces and help the black community out. Instead of being somebody who never went through that, staying in pre-encounter, going to those Shinto spaces and only wanting to stay in Shinto spaces. It's important to be able to come into spaces, learn, and come back and teach other people what you learn and bring that knowledge back. And and that's why the Nigrazance is coming in and being so much important because you can go through those uh, stages of development within uh, right there. So David, I have to ask you uh, a little bit about this Biden comment about. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And just identity politics in general. Can you riff on that a little bit? I mean, first off, with identity politics, all politics are identity politics. Everybody votes for people they feel they can identify with. Nobody's gonna vote with some, for somebody they feel like they have zero in common with and have no understanding of what they're going through. Now, identity politics isn't just gonna be about race, but it is a lot of times gonna be around race. Black people vote 90% for the Democratic Party. White males vote around 75% for the Republican Party. So everybody is practicing identity politics. It's just, which way are you going to do it? So which way are you going to do it? As far as Biden saying that you're not black if you don't know if you're going to vote for him or Trump, I mean, that shows how much arrogance he has and how overconfident he is about the black vote. He's feeling like he doesn't have to come and get our vote and convince us. And that's just not true, especially this time. You, have, um, you do have black people that are conservative that will vote for Trump. And they, and many of them are solidified in who they are and they're not all crazy. There'll be black people that are gonna vote third party, and, uh, green, and there'll be black people that vote libertarian. And everybody's gonna have their reasoning for doing what they're doing. So, I, I mean, I take Biden's comments and Trump's tweets with a grain of salt. I mean, for all I know, Biden purposely said that to get back in the news cycle. So that's all theater to me. I want to see concrete policies and a history, a history saying that you support those policies. I'm not going to trust a politician that never supported Medicare for all who says it tomorrow, therefore Medicare for all. So again, that was a funny comment in my opinion, but I need to see concrete policies and a history that he supports those policies. Now Biden, as you guys well know, was an architect in those crime bills. He pushed for those crime bills. And in that interview, if you watch the whole interview, he really mis misrepresents the CBC, Correctional Black Caucus, role in those crime bills. Uh, many of the Correctional Black Caucus members were in districts that were ravaged by crack, so they had to do something. A lot of the Correctional Black Caucus members knew that 94 crime bill was bad. And so Biden and others had to cut them certain deals to get money into their community for them to sign on to that bill. So it wasn't like the CBC ran to that bill and supported that bill. And I think we need to really go back and look at it. Also, he tried to blame uh, state governments for causing the incarceration boom. He didn't mention how he incentivized those states that they will get extra federal funding if they have more prisoners. 
So he really misrepresented the crime bill earlier in that um, in that interview. And I want people to go back and really check Biden's record on uh, criminal justice and repealing Guy Steagall and the bankruptcy bill and, you know, a host of other things. And tell me if they see this man as a man with a history that they can actually trust going it forward in the White House. Now, Trump is doesn't have a good history either. So once you understand that, you're you're back to really rationalizing who you're going to pick in that situation. So something that I've been kind of, and I think you spoke a little bit about this, but one of the big things that I've kind of uh, am leaning towards or made me go to an integral life is trying to find other members that are also into integral and trying to form sort of, in my opinion, a Senga for myself, a community of other people that are, you know, sort of engrossed with this information. Do you find that you have a, a community like that where you can connect with others and sort of get support with your ideas? Yeah, I mean, on my Facebook page, my Facebook group especially, we talk a lot about politics, alternative news, uh, independent news, and things like that. I also have a lot of people once I started posting about Ambedkar a lot from India, and they send me information from India a lot. So I find that community online really well. I'm lucky to live in a large enough city to have an integral meetup. So we actually have an integral meetup in DC. So I would definitely suggest if you're having trouble with um, finding a community is to put an integral Ken Wilbur, Ken Wilbur, Don Beck meetup together if you can. That's a really great way to meet people. But we talk about uh, Integral uh, a lot. I feel like I have a good community, but I also love introducing people to Integral Theory. So I've been able to talk to some people about Integral and get them and get them interested in it also. So, Well, how, how does that go just in terms of introducing uh, Integral Theory to folks and, and how, do they, how do they respond to it? How do they receive it? Most people really enjoy it, and it does explain a lot of different things in life, like why people progress the way they do. Um, I was able, I was lucky enough to have a conversation online with uh, Angela Nicole Walker, who's the Green Party vice president. And we and me and her got to talking about it. she had never heard of integral theory before, but she was very interested and watched a couple of the videos. And so it's something I'm going to grow along with these different people and try to have influence and, and get them interested in integral as they go. And this is somebody who's running a party. So yeah, I know if this is too early uh, for this debate, but I was really um, interested in your breakdown of the Chicago Bulls and where they are on, on the on the spiral and stuff. And I know one of the common debates we've had here is, um, I know you said Michael Jordan was orange. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you think about him as far as the kinesthetic line and sort of just being probably the best basketball player to ever play, in my opinion. Um, and then, you know, does that make him integral? What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, no. Being successful in one spot does not make you integral. Yes, he is the greatest basketball player of all time, but he had an opportunity to help the guy that would have unseated Jesse Helms Jr., and he didn't do that. And so you can't say he's integral. There's no way you can integrally justify not unseating Jesse Helms Jr., especially back in the 90s. So, um he also, if you watch those documentaries, he has a lot of grudges on people from stuff that happened from 20 and 25 years ago. Like he was talking about one guy on that documentary who didn't say hi to him and he, and he was still mad about it. He, that happened like 25 years ago now. I'm just like, he's very petty. So yes, you can be, there's like Ken Wilber says, there's several different lines of development. Basketball is a line of development. Writing is a line of development. Politics is a line of development. And he maxed out the basketball line of development. I give him that. But no, he's definitely not integral. Success in and of itself doesn't make a person integral. Also, you can be a great leader without being integral. Like A. Philip Randolph, I did an analysis of him, and I, I determined that he was orange man. Uh, verging on green, but mainly orange man. But to me, A. Philip Randolph was the most consequential black leader other than Dr. King. And so um, that right there for me was a, a very big revelation. You can be a great leader from whatever meme you're at right now today. So, so I guess a little dig a little deeper with that. So did you watch The Last Dance? I watched all of it, yeah. Okay, so his comment was, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too. Oh, and then he also, so but he, also talked, he also talked about donating to, I forgot his, the opponent at that time. What's yeah. your take on that? 
I mean, that's the ultimate orange meme um, answer, right? Republicans buy shoes too, so I'm not going to risk my money. However, I will give you some money to go and beat them. So I'm not going to do what's going to be the risky thing and anger people, but I'll do as much as I can without messing up my, my overall goal to making money and to keeping everybody happy so I can stay famous. So, I mean, that is the ultimate orange meme uh, response to that situation. You give money and be quiet and not let anybody know what you're doing. There's no way if, if Michael Jordan had done that ad for that opponent, that man would have been in the Senate in 92. And, uh, and Jesse Helms is one of the people that uh, was against school busing to bus black kids into white schools and stuff. He was a horrible, horrible person. I mean, you, I mean, he literally could have changed history if he had got Jesse Helms out of that seat. But on the basketball line, is Michael Jordan integral in your opinion? Maybe, maybe. I have, maybe <laughs> on the basketball line, he is integral then, on the basketball yeah. line alone. But, um, yeah, it's, um, it's really a shame. It's really a shame that in our community, oftentimes entertainers are the most prominent people because they're the people with the most money. And they're the people with the most influence. There's very few, there's a lot of black politicians, but many of them are on the local level. And they're usually um, party players, more instead of party bosses. So in our community, entertainers are often the most prominent people. And it's unfortunate we put entertainers in situations where they have to lead or change history. Like a white basketball player has never had to endorse anybody, you know? Because you have business leaders that'll endorse that you have, and you have all these other types of people that can endorse. So, I mean, if it was another community of people, they would have had several other people that could have helped that man get to the get to the Senate. And we had many people there in North Carolina, but there was nobody with the same level of prominence as Michael Jordan. Larry Bird has never been in a position where he had to do something to like save his community. And that will never happen for Larry Bird. That's never going to happen for him. And we have to keep that in perspective, too. Is it fair to even ask entertainers to do all that and to be that informed? You know, just thinking about that and some of Steve Kerr's controversial remarks sometimes when it comes to Trump, or you, you think of Greg Popovich or other celebrities that put their politics out there. You could also say that maybe with some Republican actors that maybe feel – uh, blackmailed as far as not getting jobs because they're out on a Republican sort of line or whatever. But I thought it was interesting with the last dance and, and sort of toward the end and, and you could, and he would, he had just won it and he was at the piano and they were, uh, one of the guys asked him, you know, are you coming back next year? And he had this thing where he, he talks about just being in the moment, you know, and, and Phil talking about Zen Buddhism and, and just appreciating for that time right now. And I really just saw the maturity maybe where he was back in 93 to just 98 of just getting to a place of where his game just seemed to rise not only this physical game but he also talked about the mental part of his game too of sort of being intertwined i appreciated that yeah uh, phil jackson he, he's a, me, a, a mindfulness meditation person i want to say he started, studied with uh jack cornfield i don't know for a fact but i think he did um so i mean yeah man it uh, mindfulness can change any workplace. I don't care what workplace it is. Um, so I, I think I, I would love to see more workplaces introducing mindfulness. I think it's just something it'll aid in all the other um, areas, arenas, uh, introducing mindfulness become even, even more mainstream. So yeah, it was, Phil Jackson is a, is a genius. And uh, mindfulness was right up there to making him uh, one of the guys that that was one of the greatest coaches of all time. So, Since we kind of opened the can of worms with the sports conversation, I'm wondering if we can get your thoughts on how professional athletes, whether it's like LeBron, who's been speaking on a lot of prominent social issues, or even going back to the whole Colin Kaepernick kneeling anthem thing. Like, uh, how do you think that someone with a large platform can best speak out for community and social issues um, in a way that would benefit the whole and, and all of them. Because, you know, the whole sports thing has become quite a divisive topic. And I'm, I'm noticing more and more conservative commentators attacking athletes for politicizing sports. So how do you think that platform could be best used? 
I mean, I, I like exactly what Colin, Colin Kaepernick did. I, I think Colin Kaepernick they gave a great example. LeBron gave a great example. And then on top of that with LeBron, he gave to a school there in Akron to give uh, inner city and underprivileged youth uh, better schooling. So he uses money and his, uh, and his voice to do what he needs to do. And all life is political. There is no part of life that's not political. This idea that I want this guy to dunk and uh, sacrifice his body on this field for me, but I don't want to hear what he has to say when something goes wrong is just totally, um, it's just wrong to me. You know, I mean, these are people, full meme stack people that have different aspects of their life. And there's no reason why you shouldn't um, talk about it on the field. And if you really want it to change, get up in your community and help it to change. If you don't want nobody kneeling, then go into your community and see if there's issues of police brutality. And if there's uh, cops that are doing uh, bad things and go and change it and fix it. Don't sit and be angry at Colin Kaepernick for doing the right thing, you know? So David, uh, we're, we're, uh, just some final thoughts. Where do you think we go from here? I know you kind of touched on it early on, but is there anything else that you would recommend to people listening to this podcast or, um, yeah, w what's the future look like for you? I mean, I think education is key. Education and disseminating information. That's, that's very important. You know, uh, the Panthers, one of their first orders of business was to, uh, to create a media arm, a propaganda arm, they called it, the propaganda arm. So, I mean, it's very important to disseminate information and bring in integral theory where you can. Of course, doing your own shadow work is important. And just try to join some local organization and put as much integral theory in that organization as you can. And that's something that's actionable that you can do right now today. So I think that's where we need to, uh, need to concentrate on. And I'll just say for myself, I mean, this conversation has been really inspiring and I've been really looking for someone or, or some methods out there that are integrating integral theory with social justice and, and more specific um, uh, racial justice and, and liberation movements. I'm so happy to see you're doing that. And something I've been thinking about is how much I would love to see someone like yourself with everything we just talked about appear on a channel like Rebel Wisdom, right? Or appear on Future Thinkers. And all of these kind of integral adjacent communities, Game B, uh, all of the other, you know, emergencia sense-making communities, they're so predominantly white. And I think the, the white culture just kind of like oozes from the screen when I watch these YouTube videos. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious, like, do you have an interest in trying to get your voice onto some of these other, uh, into the, some of these other communities or platforms? Of course, if they offered me, I would. But I mean, I really want to build my own website and channels up to where I can platform other great thinkers and have kind of like our own integral black media started up. And I think that's really important for us to have ownership over as much ownership as we can over a platform. So I've been putting myself out there, you know, and I think that um, I think that's the biggest thing. I'm not one to go and court anybody. So if they come to me, I definitely go out there. But, you know, I, I really want to build my own platform up and platform other great thinkers. So That sounds really exciting. I uh, we will do all we can to help promote your work. Uh, where, where can people find you uh, and and how can they connect with you? Uh, blackleaderanalysis.com. Um, that's uh, my website where I do all my written work. Uh, there are also links on that website to my YouTube channel, Black Leadership Analysis, um, and also my Facebook group, Black Leadership Analysis. We're open to everybody, but we concentrate on black issues. So I think that's very important to, uh, to do uh, there. So yeah, that's where you can find me, um, the blackleadershipanalysis.com and uh, the YouTube channel, Black Leadership Analysis. So. Fantastic. And I, I think uh, we, ha we now have some uh, reading to do, <laughs> Brian yeah. and myself especially. Uh, thank you for introducing me to Ruth King's work and um, definitely looking forward to, to digging into that as well. So, and thank you. Thank you. All right. It's good yeah. to see you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, David.